Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic to be able to talk with my friends that are far away to learn something and just have a good time. And it's been amazing to see how many people have enjoyed the webinars. I believe this is number 160. If you had told me I would have done this many when I started, I would have had no clue. But here we are, and we're going to keep on rolling as long as I have willing guests and um, time to do this, which right now I have plenty of. Um, just to remind everybody, we have the five-year anniversary of Surefoot Pads contest going on on Facebook. Go to Fans of Facebook group or the Surefoot Equine, no, Fans of Surefoot group. <laughs> <laughs> and the Surefoot Equine page and sign up. So it's free. You just post, you know, follow the directions on the on the contest post. We're going to have five weeks of contests. And if you enter all five weeks, you are eligible for the week six grand prize drawing of a full set of Surefoot pads value over $1,000. So um, just go ahead, go to Surefoot Equine page, follow the directions there. If you missed week one, just go ahead, go back to week one and put up a post because you have to enter all five. It just means you're not eligible for this week's drawing, which will happen on Friday during my webinar. Okay, that said, today my guest is Heidi Blackman and I am so excited to talk to her today because I just had on my newsfeed the picture of one of my best meals that I had when I was down in Costa Rica with Heidi. And my background is the infinity pool where we would go to swim while we were doing retreats. So um, this is a sort of in lieu of not being able to be there in person that we're gonna be there virtually. So welcome Heidi, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I wish I wish you were here as well in person. But I know it's, it's for now. but this is the next best thing. At least we can chat and um, and uh, catch up and that sort of thing. So Heidi, I mean, I know you pretty well now because we've been down there. I uh, it said three years ago. I can't believe it's been three years since I've uh, my first time down there. But well, I see a little high from Jinx. Hi, Jinx. Yeah, Jinx. <laughs> out there. Um, so um, just get to, first of all. Um, tell us about your yoga background. Like, how did you wind up becoming a yoga instructor? Um, it was a little bit of a curvy path. So I've been doing yoga since I was an undergraduate. Um, about, I think, I guess that's like 17 years now. Um, but I didn't even think about instructing. I went to my grad school. I started working for the U.S. government doing um, tuna fisheries policy. Um, totally different uh, like path for me. <laughs> and then I kind of got bogged down by that and um, just working in the government can have its um, own pitfalls and be difficult. And um, I went on a um, like a big uh, meeting down in Costa Rica and had this epiphany that I still wanted to live in, in Latin America. And luckily my fiance at the time was a willing participant. So we moved down here and I quit my job. And then I just, I loved yoga so much. And um, one of my favorite teachers was down here doing a training. And so Kia Miller. And so I did that training, got my initial foot in the door. And then I started teaching since 2012. And I've taught pretty much most places around here in Nosara. And now I have my own yoga studio. Which is beautiful. I, I saw it. Um, actually, I'm not sure I ever saw it finished. I saw it in construction. It was gorgeous. Um, so, and now tell us about your horse background, because what you've done is you've married the two together. So tell us how, you know, have you always been involved with horses or is that something that you came to later? Um, when I was younger, I lived in a very rural area in Northern California. And so um, I was always riding like all my neighbor's horses. I never had horses of my own. So like any horse that was like semi-rideable, I would ride and um, Western pleasure. And then I started doing um, hunters and um, some jumpers. I mean, I would ride anybody's horse that would let me ride their horse. So, and I uh, worked at the barn to kind of to pay for lessons and did some basic showing, but nothing fancy. And then, um, and then in college, it just got too expensive because I moved to Southern California. So I, I would occasionally buy a lesson and go to a fancy barn <laughs> and polo wrap my legs because I didn't have my chaps and like, you know, but, um, and then I moved here and 
having a horse is much more reasonable cost wise. So I met Carrie, my business partner, and um, she's a matchmaker down here for horses. So she found me my first horse. And, and then um, since then I've, had, I've got another horse and, um, and now we're starting to do, you'll be happy to know, Carrie built a new arena. Oh. It's like a big jumping arena, like a 40 by 40. And um, she's built all these jumps and a cross country course. So it's really fun. Now she has a whole team and she's starting to compete. And so I'm, I'm dabbling in that. <laughs> oh, wow. That's awesome. So um, I've actually uh, shown video of your first horse on more than one occasion on my Friday Surefoot webinars. I've forgotten his name. Frisco. Crisco. And he's, he's the, um, if anybody's ever watched my Friday webinars, he's the one that sways like crazy. He just loves Surefoot. And I would use him as my demo horse during the retreats because he was so phenomenal. He just loved it. And he's a super hot little guy to ride, but on Surefoot, he's, he's like um, heaven. He just falls asleep. Yeah. Night and day. And he had that kind of, um, Hear about tope training that it's abusive training but they um, want them to pick up their feet so they kind of tie them down and, and whip them and so he had that and so he tends to have that hollow back high head carriage as you've seen but after surefoot if i put it on put him on them for a little bit he'll actually reach forward and have that low like almost peanut pusher <laughs> that's how long and low he gets <laughs> It's so awesome. All right. So, so you moved to, what year did you move to Nasura? 2012. Okay. And then you started to um, teach yoga and what year did you meet Carrie? Did you meet Carrie right away? I met Carrie probably either the end of 2012. I want to say probably 2013 because I started to teach at a studio here in Pilata and she was like my only student for a long time. <laughs> So it was like slow season and back then just not a lot of people came to this town so wow. uh yeah she was my like number one student and uh and then we quickly got to talking about horses and and just tying the two together more and more so that's probably when you but you well i'm sure that you were using your yoga for your own riding at that point were you I think using it more of the philosophical parts, which I think I still do as far as, um, you know, especially with Frisco when I first got him, I probably shouldn't have had, I shouldn't probably have <laughs> bought that horse just because. <laughs> he's lucky to yeah. have you. All I can say is yeah. he's lucky to have you. He's pretty much retired now and that's good. For, I'm, I'm happy for him because he, he, he came from a hard spot. And so a lot of it for me was just mentally slowing down and just, um, you know, I was actually talking, I taught yoga right before this, and it was a little bit challenging. And just how sometimes when in riding or in yoga, when we meet challenges, a lot of times I find that like humans tend to meet that with more intensity or, or urgency, like they want to rush through it or just kind of put more muscle into it. And I find um, that the best thing is actually to try to meet that with like calm and you know it's easier said than done of course but <laughs> and slowing down and so those kind of things helped me a lot because he was just in a hard a difficult headspace to train so you and carrie formed what's called equisol which um is how i wound up meeting you that um, um i Callie and I, Callie King from CRK Training, now horse class, did the effortless rider courses together. And then um, I had heard about Equisol from someone who used to work for me. And that was kind of in the back of my mind. And then Callie and I got to talking about, wouldn't it be fun to have a retreat where we have guests from our effortless rider course come down and be immersed in a culture and yoga and horses. And so, um, so we did it. We contacted Carrie and, and uh, Heidi, and we came down, I guess it was three years ago. It's so hard to believe that. Um, and we did our first retreat. And so the thing that struck me, that first year, I have to say, just for anybody who remembers, um, I was four weeks out of surgery having glute medius reattached. They had had to put in two pins and stitch up into the tendon, and I was on crutches and painkillers. So <laughs> I did not attend yoga class. <laughs> 
<laughs> that first retreat, but I did the second retreat that we did in June of that, June or July of that year. And the thing that struck me, Heidi, that, that was so much fun is that your philosophy of teaching yoga and my philosophy of teaching riding melded so beautifully without ever having a, a conversation. We never talked about it, but the, it was the same basic thread through your teaching and my teaching. And I think that that was the thing for me that was so fun and amazing. Um, so tell us a little bit about your, your philosophy behind the yoga that you teach. Well, um, so I want to say in 2014, I started training with Annie Carpenter and she teaches a type of yoga called smart flow. And now I'm certified smart flow teacher. Um, she, she, I actually, we were talking about you because I, ha I had a phone call with her last week and I passed on your information because I was, she was talking about how she, this, I didn't even know about her, but she said that she, she, um, used to do Feldenkrais. Oh, wow. And I'm probably saying that wrong, but uh, <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this is ridiculous because, um, she just comes from that anatomy background. She was a dancer and she, is just really into understanding how the body works, um, you know, how to work smartly. That's why she calls it smart flow, kind of like effortless rider. It's like, you know, you know, stacking the joints and finding neutral pelvis and, you know, exploring your body essentially and like staying curious about what you're doing. Um, and so I just fell in love with that sort of alignment based yoga that's still, you know, very tied into the breath and how that helps you move and flow. So it's like that idea of in, in the movement, finding the balance, but all in, in regards to your own body, which might not be perfectly balanced. Right. <laughs> and, um, and the thing I remember is like uh, during the retreats, I would have I would come after you. So we would start with morning yoga at seven o'clock in the morning, and then we'd have breakfast. And then I would do my lecture at nine o'clock, I think it was. And um, that, like I said, that first retreat, I didn't come to the yoga because I couldn't, I couldn't get up and get going enough in the morning. It took me a while, but I would come up and do my lecture. And then I'd find out that what you had taught that morning in the yoga was exactly that topic for me on that day. And so it was this fascinating dovetail between your, your progression and my progression. And it was the exact same progression. <laughs> it was really, really Yeah. And I, and on the retreat weeks, I've, I've over time started deciding that, okay, I'm going to work from the ground up and follow like the chakra system. And so starting with, you know, the ground, literally what's touching the ground and the legs, femurs and pelvis. And then, yeah, that was kind of your when yeah. you're riding, it's like, you got to start with what's <laughs> keeping you in the saddle. <laughs> yep. So we both start from the pelvis basically. And so from the yoga perspective, what chakra are we talking about? Um, well, it's kind of a combination of two, the Sadhisthana is the second, second chakra and the Manipura is the first chakra. And tell and us basically what about what, what your philosophy says about those chakras so that we can understand why that's important in riding. So the first chakra is all about um, a sense of safety and grounding. And um, so in the physical body, it's um, whatever's touching the ground. And a lot of times we associate it with the femurs, the feet. Um, and so the basic idea is you can't move up the chakra system without having some, some balance in that initial one. And for that chakra, it means feeling safe um, feeling like your basic needs are being met. Um, and then the second chakra is a little bit higher, um, you know, for women, it's like our womb and sort of sex organs, uh, hips and yeah. pelvis. And um, this is all about relationships, fluidity. Um, it's the water element. Um, and so, and acceptance is a big theme that comes up there. And in the physical body, it's the, I mean, for me, it's the pelvis. <laughs> right. And, and as you know, I, when I teach riding, I always start with the pelvis with, well, actually with the breath, I've, I'll put my hands on a person and I'll just feel their breathing between their abdomen and their back. And then just if their pelvis is anterior tilt, in other words, they're hollow or they're round, bring them up into the middle. 
and you know, so much of what I work with when I work with riders is fear because mm -hmm. most of the riders that you and I work with are older women and fear comes up for older women. And so that sense of safety, that's so interesting that you say that those chakras are about safety because once you get that pelvis organized, when I push on their back, they're solid, that fear starts to go away. So that's really, again, I, you know, I love doing these webinars because I learn more in depth about what my friends are doing because sometimes I'm so busy doing what I'm doing teaching that I miss pieces of what my my peers are doing. So that's really cool that that chakra is all about safety. Yeah, and I love, I've learned some little tricks from you just watching you work with people, like the numbers when people do get kind of, you know, they the energy lifts a little bit and they get a little fearful and how you kind of talk people through it, get them to move a little bit, which is, a, you know, and then putting the number to it. Okay, where, you know, where are you on this? Um, chart from one to 10 and how much that can help people um, come back down and and just yeah when you show them physically in their body that they're stable like you can push on them right and and yoga is about a lot about finding that kind of stability isn't it yeah and that's basically a big part of the yoga I teach is we're always looking for neutral even if we're not physically in neutral can you feel like you can get there from wherever you are like you have a safety strap almost so the you move your maybe you have to move away from neutral by putting your arm up and then it makes your back kind of hollow but then can you feel like the sense that you're coming back to center now one of the things that you've talked about in your teaching and i want to bring this in now because i think it's so important um so many people that like when my Feldenkrais training, we had a lot of yoga instructors that had actually injured themselves because they had pushed their bodies so hard. And when when I was able to attend your yoga, which was after that first retreat, um, one of the things you kept saying was to me so familiar as a classic Feldenkrais tenant. So so talk to us about, you know, about effort and how much people should try to put themselves into a position versus what what you have always uh, talked about i yeah i almost always say if it feels like too much it is too much and it sounds like a really simple thing you're the only one who knows what everything feels like in your body like i can have some ideas if you can't breathe <laughs> or if you're you know crunching your face or something, I, maybe you went too far, but, um, you know, really, you know what it feels like in your body. And if it feels like too much, it is too much. So that basic, um, also putting the onus on the practitioner, you know, you are your own teacher and your own guide. I'm there to help you along the path, but really you have to listen to yourself to, to know when it's too much. Because and then, what happens is people look at each, at other people and they start yeah. to yeah, it's very hard to be in an all levels class because then you kind of see the progression of and people want to get there right away and they don't maybe that will never be their practice. And, and that is the yoga is, is actually going through that practice of backing off if you really need to, if it makes sense going a little further, because on the other side, there's people who never give it their all you know, they kind of always hold back a little. So, so it's learning about yourself. What are your tendencies and, and how do you safely push yourself and draw back when you need to? Yeah. And, and what I love too, was that you, you modified, you always had a way to modify so that everybody, because, because our, our retreats, we had people of all different levels of yoga. Me was like basically crippled the second, second retreat. <laughs> She's a very flexible body, just for anybody watching. <laughs> you know, I couldn't stand on my left leg at all. Um, and um, but people who had practiced yoga for a long time, and and I was impressed by your approach on how to make a make everybody feel comfortable and b adapt to everybody's level. And is that something in the style of yoga, the smart is it smart flow that you teach, or is that just something that you've come to on your own? I think it does take a bit of confidence in your teaching to teach to especially beginners. For me, that's very rewarding, but it also means that you have to be have a 
basket of tools, just like you have <laughs> when you teach writing. You, know, you have to have a lot of options. And in yoga, there's limitless options of how you can approach something. And, um, but I think also smart flow does teach you that, you know, some of the, you can make anything really challenging. Like I can, if I can focus your mind on little parts of your body doing little motions, you have to work really hard, you know? So it's, um, it's mentally challenging and really challenging the most basic pose if you get really into the minutia. And, um, and so you can hold people's attention that way and, and challenge them without putting their head, their leg behind their head, you know? <laughs> so, so it sounds like you can take a, a movement that might seem quite simple and make it much deeper by how you focus it. Exactly. Exactly. And, and again, it's all a continuum of movement. So it's, um, you know, finding this one movement, but where on the continuum are you given your body and that day and how you're feeling and, and just exploring the continuum. Um, and there's, um, we talk about, oh, I always talk about, I usually give um, effort and return. They're called like movement principles. So I'll say one effort, like take your arm overhead and then one return, because probably that's going to take you in a back bend, for example. And so you, the two are working against each other. You could think of it that way, but together they keep you in balance. So it's that idea of finding that, um, you know, safe, safe place, <laughs> neutral. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's such an interesting idea to keep searching for safety as opposed to for limits. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of times if you work this way, the limit is going to come mentally before it comes physically. So it kind of, um, it, it, it challenges people in that way as well. So, okay, so we start, you and I both, we start with the pelvis and basically this idea of safety. And then where do you go from there? From there, I go up to uh, the third chakra, which is right behind your, uh, your belly button, a little below and behind. And um, it's known as our powerhouse or our like central energy center. So we, I generally start to um, make things a little bit more challenging <laughs> that day. And <laughs> maybe some core kind of, you know, um, abdominal, low back work. Um, but generally, often I'll get like glares in class that day because it's like, <laughs> I'm intentionally inviting people to find their edge. And then I'm asking them, where is that edge? And have you gone too far? And should you come back or should you put in more effort? And, and you know, sometimes I can, um, you know, push or, or pull people back if I see them going too far. But that's one of those moments where it's, you know, with riding is like, you know, you pick like I did, you pick the wrong horse, <laughs> too much horse, you know, for your skill level. And it's like, you know, where do you go from there? Like, do you just keep pushing? You increase the intensity or do you find your edge, get outside help, <laughs> you know, find more resources to, to, um, to again, like play with the edge. That's really interesting. And it's interesting that you bring that into to your own horse experience, um, that it's it's kind of exploring those edges. It's kind of like, flirt, I call it flirting with the line, seeing, you know, whether it's fear or whether it's pain or whether it's, uh, you know, um, experience. If I go a little over, what what is my reaction? And then can I come back? And, and I think what you're describing is the same thing that so many people think when they get to the edge that they have to push harder. And really right. what, what I find is important is that they can take a step back. Yes. Oh my gosh. So much so. And, and in that, in that they can get further usually. Right. Like that easing by, you know, it, can you find just, okay. I always said today in class, and for those of us who always go 110%, what's it like to go at 80% <laughs> and does it actually allow you to go further? You know, it's, um, it's an interesting thought because, you know, in our society, 
usually go stronger, go harder, go faster. And that's how you're going to try to get there. Yeah, no pain, no um, gain, right? That's the philosophy that yeah. so many of us have been trained into that, you know, if it's not, and I've actually had students that equated pain with correct in writing. Yeah. And that's really uh, dangerous because they're going to get injured. And actually, you know, I mean, I got injured because I didn't step back from the edge years ago. Um, you know, I've turned it into something else in the end, but it had very devastating <laughs> repercussions at the time. Um, and yeah. I think that it's hard for many people to give themselves permission to step back. Yeah, I think it's very difficult when you're up against something that's been a pattern your whole life and something that you've witnessed other people, kind of how they deal with challenge or fear. It's hard to change those patterns. In, in yoga, they're called samskaras. And they, they say they're like a record, a groove on a record, mm. you know, that it's hard to change the groove. <laughs> yeah, change but this is pattern. a great way because in, with horses, if you push too far, the, the danger level, the chance of injury for any or everyone concerned escalates. So it sounds like by working with that chakra in your yoga practice, you can start to A, become aware of it and B, start to learn the skill of taking a step back to reevaluate. Yeah, and the other the other part of that that area of the body is confidence and like oh, wow. and, and harnessing your own power. So it's, you know, at the same time, it's for those, especially those of us who are kind of like shot, you know, don't just stay away from challenge completely. You know, it's, it's also in, in the, for those people, finding your central powerhouse in, and, and um, you know, being a good leader for a horse. Um, so that's the other part of it. It's kind of, I mean, I love that chakra. That's the yeah, thing I, I talked today. <laughs> associated with confidence. And that's so fascinating because when I'm working with a rider, of course, I get the pelvis and the breathing, but they have to do this tiny little fold uh, to bring their rib cage over their pelvis. And so many people have been taught to sit up straight and therefore arch their back and kind of open that area. But when you just do that tiny little fold and anybody's ridden with me knows what I'm talking about, this little fold, it aligns the rib cage over the pelvis. But it's so interesting that that's where, because so many people think confident is kind of taking that very care. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't realize it was down there. So that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, there's even in yoga, we look at like postural things and what it says, it can say something about that person. You know, like I always have my shoulders, like <laughs> I have to work against this pattern, you know, to get my shoulders back. And, you know, people consider that, oh, there's, you know, like protecting your heart. You're kind of like not wanting to be vulnerable. Um, whereas the puffed out chest, <laughs> you know, walking like this, it's kind of, you're probably vulnerable also, but you're def you're defending it in another way, right? By by, by kind of um, having that persona. So it's really interesting, actually, looking at your body and kind of what it's saying about your personality and your all these things that come up for you, especially when you're learning something new. Oh yeah, but both of those postures in riding are not as effective as the as the middle place, right? Because if you're if you're uh, in a what I call a C curve, you're going to be vulnerable, and if yeah. you're in that hollow back position, you're not stable. So um, that, but the, the the confidence comes from the area just above the belly button or at the belly button. I think that's really interesting, um, yeah. and again, that's. Um, when we did the retreats, of course, I would start at the pelvis and then work up and then. Uh, in the riding, I would go down to the legs, which was uh, covered in your first part. But okay, so now we've got pelvis and legs. What next? Um, then we move up to the heart. The ch the ch well, it's heart. I usually combine these two in, in retreats because I just run out of days too. <laughs> yeah. You only have nine days. <laughs> but um, but uh, chest is heart, um, and then uh, the throat chakra is like shoulders. Also, so I'll I'll generally go do a little back bending, maybe um, practice opening the heart, more like chest opening than back bending. Think of it that way, and then um, with that arms, um, the different positions of the arms, shoulder blades, what 
just the whole <laughs> shoulder girdle and what and just building awareness there of what happens shoulder heads shoulder blades and you know some people it's just a very murky area <laughs> yeah well a lot of people think that their shoulders joints are here right as opposed to the ball and socket joint where they really are so in riding that's so important to identify where the shoulder joints are because that's where our arms actually tie into our torso right into our yeah. but there's something now and i've forgotten and i'm hoping you can remind me or i can remind you to talk about it um you you would talk about the spiral the to um and i can't you did that a lot with the arms and with the feet uh -huh. and i can you talk about that a bit because i found that while I didn't use those terms when I teach riding, it was so appropriate and I can't remember it, how you talk about it. Um, well, like internal and external rotation is um, our two pretty big concepts in yoga. So we either talk about it in regards to our femurs and our legs. And so, um, yeah, I loved it in, in riding. I especially like talking about the legs internally rotating a lot so that the inner thigh moves down if you're seated. You could do it while you're seated <laughs> right now. And um, and a lot of times, the more you do that, like if you're standing, you'll come into an arch. And so like playing with how, how the leg bones affect the pelvis. And then also in the arms, especially when your arms are overhead like this, um, you wanna have your external rotation. So the inner bicep moves back by your ear, tricep forward, and that sets up, um, the shoulder blades and the shoulder girdle so that as the shoulder blades go out to the sides as the arms rise, it wraps the muscles basically around, um, around the, um, I'm forgetting the names, but arm bones. Humorous, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And, um, and it just makes it really stable, especially if you're weight bearing um, or like when you're riding, if you have contact, you wanna make sure you're, uh, shoulders aren't up by your ears and the shoulders aren't out of your sockets in some way. Um, but yeah, it's a, arms, r contact and shoulders, you know, I, it, the way riding is traditionally taught, it's sit up straight, shoulders back, chest out. But that so does not describe the, the function and how we want to be in the saddle, because as soon as we take that posture, we're pulling on the horse's mouth. Um, and there's no way you cannot pull as soon as you sit up straight, shoulders back, chest out, your arms retract and you're pulling. But when I, when I remember the way you talked about that spiral in the femur head, uh, sorry, the humerus heads and the way the arms came in, the arms then simply just rest by your side with an open chest rather than that tense pulled position. And I think that was, that's the thing that I, um, it's it's so vivid in my mind, but I don't have the words for it. Yeah, it will. And I think what also you, as the shoulder blades go out to the sides, the the shoulder blades actually get wider. And one thing I always hear in writing is like shoulder blades together, and it makes me cringe because <laughs> you never want to put your shoulder blades together and like pop your chest open, and you never teach it that way. And I, it's like you actually want to imagine the shoulder blades getting wide. And, and if you think about wrapping your arm muscles that way, it makes the bones feel like they go out a little bit and like wide, and then your elbows can follow and you have the root beer float. <laughs> <laughs> and for people who don't know what root beer float is, I'll explain. So um, when I was doing clinics, I would go out to Deer Park, Washington to uh, Northwest Trails and I taught clinics there on Memorial Day weekend for years, and they taught summer camps with kids. And so I taught them the, the, the grounded pelvis with the little fold with the chest forward. And, and I never say shoulders back if you've ever taken a lesson with me. I always say chest forward because shoulders back is pulling. Um, anyway, the next year I went back and the kids, uh, they had adapted it for kids and they called it root beer float so that you root your pelvis, you have a beer belly and you float your chest. And so they would actually have root beer floats during the clinics and I was there. Um, and it's great. It's such a fun one. It makes everybody smile. Um, not everybody knows what a root beer float is. Um, so sometimes I have to explain. <laughs> um, but for anybody who's been to A&W, you would know what a root beer float is. Yeah. Yeah. And your book, I think it's the Simplify Your Writing book where you talk about 
um, yeah, like drawing your whole rib cage forward. Like I use that in my yoga practice now to, because then the shoulder blades do just slide down the back. Like if you imagine your whole three-dimensional rib cage moving forward. I love that vis visualization and you have a picture of it too. Yeah, um, it's great. Okay, and then we go from the shoulders. Where do we go from there? Um, there's a third eye chakra and a crown chakra. Um, I usually tie those together as well and I'll do it more from a, your gaze. Um, sometimes I'll do a practice. I don't know if I did this on our retreats, but um, uh, it's called a drishti uh, point of focus with your eyes. And it's that idea of, you know, focusing on something, but not being um, intensely focused on it. It's that soft focus. And every posture in yoga has a drishti associated with it. So you can kind of do a whole practice where you really focus on just your soft eyes. And it, it's a very calming, and this is uh, associated with the um, intuitive self um, the, you know, self with a capital S. <laughs> uh, and so um, uh, tapping into our inner wisdom or our deeper self um, is kind of the whole idea here. So, you know, tying, tying it all together and, and um, that's usually where I go from there. And also the neck, we do stuff with the neck. And the when you brought up soft eyes, it instantly made me think of Sally Swift. And you know the soft eyes, breathing, centering, and building blocks. And and here we are at yoga again, right? The pelvis is the center. The pelvis and the those three chakras, um, the building blocks, the alignment of the body, the soft eyes, and the breathing. I I just love how we keep seeing these archetypal patterns show up in so many different disciplines and in so many. We can't escape them. Yeah. Yeah, and I just, the more I study and learn, I feel like the more I uncover, even little, um, you know, in Chinese medicine, some of the, where they find the um, meridian lines and they can tie that to where uh, um, central nerve clusters are. And now they're, you know, it's just like, we're with science, we're starting to uncover why there are these things, but I feel like in biomechanics, of course, but um, it's really interesting. Even like in yoga, we always say like reach through the ring finger to energize your arm. And I'm always thinking that's my reins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that feeling of pushing forward rather than pulling back. So it's, right. it's just, um, it's amazing how many little um, overlaps there can be. And, and, it, and what I love also about your practice is it's very um, neutral, if you will. There's, you don't have to adhere to any philosophy or anything. Like that. It's really um, getting in touch with oneself and being present with oneself in the practice as opposed to any kind of um, guru or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's more of a self-led practice and, um, and, and mindfulness, you know, just starting to be aware of your postural tendencies, your physical things, and then also your, your mental, <laughs> mental constructs and what comes up for you there, those patterns. So yeah, it's just, um, and I try to, you know, I have a bad sense of humor, but at least I have a sense of humor. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It's fun. You make it fun. And I think for me, um, you know, sometimes people get so serious about things and and um, reverential isn't quite the right word, but they, they take it very seriously. And I think even in writing, we see people that take it very seriously. And I'm not saying you should make light of it, but so I think that we need to find the joy in it as opposed to the intensity. Um, and that's what I love about your work is that it's fun. I mean, you make it light, um, you make it feel like you can do it. Um, yeah, yeah. For sure, definitely. And I will say I read a lot of um, like Buddhist books and I'm always, and I watch a lot of their vlogs and stuff. I'm always taken away by, you think a monk would be, you know, a Rinpoche, very like serious. They all crack jokes the whole time. I mean, they always are saying one of their main, you know, take homes is, is, you know, it takes consistent practice, with a sense of lightheartedness and joy, you know, and, and 
those two things, that consistent practice, and then also just coming at it with a bit of playfulness. And so. Oh, well, that's interesting. Because I remember um, Denny Emerson spoke at uh, one of the center writing annual meetings years ago. And he talked about Sally Swift. And he said, one of the key things about Sally was the joy that she brought to her teaching. And that was for me, such a big piece that I took into my teaching that if it wasn't fun, why are we doing this? Um, and the, and it, right, because there's there's enough drama in life and I can't go to horror films, okay? I can't watch scary no. films and I can't watch horror no. films. <laughs> no, I can't do it either. Yeah, and so well, you know, sometimes we, life can get, and even right now, you know, with COVID, life can get pretty stressful. Um, but it's important that I think we keep looking for those little moments of joy, or at least those little moments of peace um, that a yoga practice can bring, a meditative practice can bring, or even, or more importantly, quiet moments with our horse. So do you ever practice yoga around your horses? Is that something that you've ever done? Um, I have done it. I, um, I've also really liked massage and just playing with um, massage with my horse. So I'll, like, uh, on a couple of retreats we've done where we don't ride actually and they're more like energetic exploration and we'll put the horse in the round pen or out in the pasture and just do some basic poses and they're often quite curious and come up and what are you doing <laughs> they, they can quickly tell you don't have a lead rope and that you're just there for for not you know no pressure um and so yeah i've done things like that and then often we'll do a little um massage on them or do their meridian lines and yeah it's amazing to kind of um balance it out with them or or i found like even i rode yesterday and i did like jumping lesson and i was kind of in a hurry when i got there and i I felt, I felt like my horse kept trying to slow me down. Like he would stop and he would just put his muzzle right here, like on my face. And I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and it was just like, stop. And um, at the end of class, I, I felt this like need to do something fun for him. So we just went down to the river and he got to roll and eat grass and do his thing. And sometimes that's where I find like more the joy where I'm sitting watching him do what he wants to do roll in the sand and um you know he kind of entertains my ideas of what I want what I want him to do <laughs> so now that you've brought up the river I think we have to talk a little bit about where what is available down in Nosora one of the reasons why it's so special is you've got river and beach and mountains and just tell people a little bit about about the area because that was one of the things um the culture, but the environment is so uh, interesting, so varied. Yes, yeah. Costa Rica is a tiny country, but it has a lot of variants. Um, where we are is called the dry forest. So um, it's totally dry, no rain, usually from November, December through April or May. And so we're just starting to get really dry here. We're, we're even, we lose some of the greenery, but um, it's it's warm the beach is close by it's about a two minute walk from here um and we have nice flat white beaches that we can still ride on so that's yeah fun. that was one of the highlights that's a bucket list for sure um and then we have mangroves and we have like a, a pretty big river system that comes through and then mangroves alongside that so that's also one of my favorite rides is we ride through a reserve and you get to see these big mangroves kind of growing out. And then the rest of the year, it rains in the afternoons usually, like May through, you came here once, I think. In, yeah. yeah, it rained, it poured every evening. Never yeah, got at three o'clock, it starts <laughs> raining. <laughs> and um, so that, and that's nice because then we have waterfalls more, you know, it's kind of every part of the year we get a little something different. Um, and then uh, we don't usually have retreats during like August, September, October because it's uh, like monsoon season. So it rains a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting climate and, um, uh, and, the, and the food actually, that was the other thing is that post I put up this morning is there's such fresh food and they catch like the tuna right off the shores and uh, yeah. fish and vegetables and fruits and 
really quite amazing. So, okay, so if you were to say how how yoga can benefit riders, like what is what for someone who's never done any yoga or is curious about or wanting to make an improvement in their riding, um, what would you what would you say to those folks? I would say that yoga is a great way to learn body awareness primarily, um, especially when you start. Um, my teacher who got this from Martha Graham, actually a choreographer is that she says that um, sensation is the language of the body. And I find that to really be true. And many of us, like you were saying earlier about pain, um, a lot of times when someone first stretches a muscle group that they're not familiar with, they'll go, oh, ah, <laughs> you know, they, they think it's like pain, but it's usually just the sensation of stretching. So starting to, to feel where, you know, what your body is doing and, and also your example of knowing where your shoulders are and your thigh bones are the same, knowing what your hip joint is and where that comes from. And even in your basic movements throughout your day, just where are you bending from to do a pick something up? Um, and then when you're riding, you know, someone, your instructor tells you to hinge at your hips or come in a jump position, you know, where is that coming from? Um, and then I also find, you know, of course there's strength building and flexibility building, and you feel um, more of this like energetic opening in your body. Um, but when you're riding, also when you're using your aids, being able to isolate movements, yeah, um, huge. you know, especially in your legs, but also in your arms, learning like when we do twists, which is the other uh, aspect of, you know, that central area of our power system, but like uh, centered riding, you know, when you turn from center, when you're riding, you know, initiating that from your center rather than just your reins. Right. Or your upper body. Yeah. Or your upper body. So it's, I think that body awareness of exploring what it's like to move your body and feel your body in a lot of different positions and what it takes for you to find balance in those positions and find your strength, then um, it's a much safer environment on a yoga mat than on a moving horse. <laughs> so it gives you just a whole new set of tools and and awareness that you can then bring into your day-to-day -day life and especially in your writing. Yeah, and for, for women that are starting to age, if you will, keeping that, I'm not, not me. <laughs> um, keeping that flexibility is just one of the things, uh, you know, movement is life. And I, and I always think about that um, in terms of longevity, that it, as long as we keep moving, we're alive. And it's when we stop moving, whether that's mentally, emotionally, or physically, that's when we're starting to die. And, you know, I always go back to my mom as the example, when she had Alzheimer's, she couldn't think thoughts anymore. And so you could watch that fading and you could watch her aging. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I think that that's any form of movement and, and it may, like not everybody may be drawn to yoga. There's obviously other movement types, but I think if mm -hmm. it's important that we keep moving. Absolutely. And, you know, in yoga, they say you're only as old as your spine. So, and, or they'll sometimes say it like uh, you're only as old as your spine flex is not flexible, I guess you would say. So if you can maintain a, you know, a flexible spine, then, you know, your longevity is, is said to be not only prolonged, but also more enjoyable, you know? And um, yeah, I know a lot of people who also have done martial arts and really tied that into just keeping moving and also with riding. There's a lot of um, parallels there. I think Heidi Potter actually um, has done quite a bit of that, but yeah, I think it's so important even just walking. <laughs> yeah. But, Yep. Any kind of movement. Well, Heidi, so, so now uh, there's, I know a lot of people have a lot of choices when it comes to yoga. There's all, there's all different styles. There's all, you know, there's hot yoga, cold, you know, how does one decide what's the right one for them? You got to do some exploring. 
and, 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 and see what really resonates with you and what makes you want to do more yoga and, and, and give it some time, you know, go to a few, but also it's finding the right teacher. Um, I know I've talked to a lot of people on retreats and they go back and they live in a rural area and there's only one option maybe for yoga and, and it's not, doesn't work for them. And then it's finding something online, um, you know, finding something that, um, makes sense for you, that you feel safe. And a lot of teachers are newer or, or younger and, um, you know, they, they just move really fast, I think in class. So a lot of the hot yogas and, the, um, the, I mean, you, across the board really, but, um, you know, really be, um, what's the word? Be picky. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because that's the don't thing. give up after the first one, and there's lots of yoga too that are like restorative yoga we do on retreats too. Oh, I love Yin restorative yoga. day. <laughs> yeah, restorative. Everybody loves to, not everybody actually, but some people love restorative day where we lay on pillows and you kind of prop yourself up in these um, opening positions, but they're very mild and um, they work more on your nervous system than anything. What a calming on restorative day. Yeah. That's after the core day. We, I usually give them a day. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, your, your uh, process was really great. Cause we'd have like a couple days and a hard day and then we do rest and everybody was like, Oh, and we'd go up not far from where this pool is on a, on a plate, on a platform that had an overview of the, that's the Pacific ocean actually in the background of my backdrop. Um, that's looking west from the pool. Um, and people love the sunset and watching the, the you know, the retreat, the, day and in restorative postures. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But find, yeah, find someone who, who gives a lot of options. Let's say yeah. that. And, and I think that, you know, whether it's yoga or uh, any kind of body work, um, you know, it's so important to find a, a person, a, a teacher, a practitioner that resonates with you and that honors and respects who you are as an individual, because this is where, you know, in, in teaching writing for so long, I get students and, and their teachers were not listening to them as a student or not honoring their body because they didn't have that body. The teacher has another body and they can do things and they can't understand why the student can't do it. So finding somebody who's going to have some empathy with if you have some physical difficulties or if you are older or, you know, if you're struggling with something to not push you to the end degree, but to say, hey, take, do what's right for you. And that to me was one of the things in your teaching that was um, so important to, because that's how I deal with my students is what's, what's good for them not fit into this model. And that's where you and I, um, I felt so, so comfortable. It was easy to work with you because we were on the same page all the time. And that's why um, I appreciated your teaching so much. Well, thank you. I obviously feel the same <laughs> times, times a hundred with working with you. And I, I will say now, sometimes I'll work with someone and they'll say something like jam your heels down. Maybe not like that, but, and I just ignore them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, it's also that it's like finding your, your inner teacher after, you know, getting some good tips. And my teacher was going over with me. She was like, what makes a good teacher? And, and we were talking about how it's, 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 finding a teacher, just like you're saying with the empathy, but also someone who seems like they've experienced it themselves in their own body and, or had injuries, had, you know, or had enough student exposure that they know what that might be like. And so, um, yeah, there's something to that. It's like that, that, um, authenticity or, or, you know, seeing someone who's been around the block a couple of times. <laughs> well, I always say, you know, you can kind of me and tell me you broke your neck yesterday. I'm like, yeah, okay, we can do this. But if you come to me and tell me you just had a baby, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I actually remember riding when I was like six months pregnant with you and you were like going to put your hands and you were like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> it's true. I, I, I do not know what to do with that. So. 
Well, Heidi, this has been, it's so great to visit with you and spend some time with you. And um, I know you have an online course, so just tell people, and that you have a retreat coming up this summer. So just tell people where they can find out more about you and your course. Sure. I have, so I have a personal yoga website, HeidiYoga.com. And um, so the, all this information is on there. Um, well, what was that again? Because you blipped for Heidi, Heidi B. Yoga. B. And then um, our retreat um, um, page is equisolretreats.com. And then we have a retreat coming up in July. We just posted it yesterday. It's a five-day retreat, and um, it will be led by me and my partner, Carrie, um, who teaches based on Wendy's teachings. <laughs> we had Carrie come on and talk about Surefoot one day on one of the Friday webinars. Oh, so if you want to meet Carrie, you can just go to watch that webinar. Yeah, so it'll be riding lessons, trail riding, um, yoga, mindfulness. Um, and then um, I have a course with Callie that I've partnered with. It's called Yoga for Riders and it's yogaforriders.com. And um, it's a year long access and it's, uh, I believe, 28 classes. And I just recorded three more classes that we're going to be adding to it. Can they find so, that? And I actually, what's that? Can they find that at Horse Class? The, it is on horse class, but it has its own website too. So I think it horse class then will link to yogaforriders.com. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it's all through Cali. And then, um, and what was I going to say about that? The, no, I guess that was it. <laughs> Film some more classes for that. Oh yeah. I know what I was going to say is I filmed a chair class actually. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, because I had a lot of um, riders actually have knee issues and, and had difficulty sitting cross-legged or just doing some of the poses. And so I did a whole flow actually using a chair and it was, um, it was really fun. So, um, so yeah, I mean, really it, it's for all levels and we, we tie it in, there's Callie does horse homework. So we tie in some of the classes then with um, uh, how you apply it riding. And um, yeah, it's a great fun class. There's a, a, a message board and there's a good community. I think there's about a thousand people on it now. And oh, wow. That's yeah, great. so it's great. I answer all the, you know, if you need modifications, I always send those in. I'm sure you have a similar yeah. setup with your program. So um, <laughs> yeah, so you can reach me in all those ways. And hopefully at some point we'll have Wendy back here in Costa Rica. Yeah start traveling again probably hopefully next year we'll see is africa going this year um yeah we're going to go in the end of september and october we moved our 2020 rides to 2021 we still have a couple of spots there so if anybody's interested in going to kenya on horseback safari to the masai mara just let me know <laughs> i know you guys have talked about it. <laughs> on my bucket list yeah it's really amazing and and because of covid the game is more plentiful because the lodges have been empty. So the game is quite amazing right now. And then are you going to do it next year as well? Since you skipped a year? Yeah, we have dates in September, 2022. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining me and thank you, Heidi. It's been so much fun to visit with you. I miss seeing you in person, but yeah, I miss you. Get there again it's for having me. in Costa Rica for me. All right. I will. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you um, later this week. Um, bye. <laughs> bye.